All right, so hello everyone again, um, and good evening again on this uh, cold night in Colorado, uh, on this last one of the uh, uh, last meeting of the of the year, a year in which we had had all sorts of great uh, lectures, and anywhere from obviously focusing on the Rocky Mountain region, but also in other parts of the world and even beyond it. And we have a touch on all sorts of topics from the history of cartography to what we're going to hear tonight in, in, in what it is, how maps can also uh, inter interface or interact with other uh, uh, communication medium to spread its message. And so uh, it's going to be a great lecture to close the year. Um, this was also a year in which we started gathering in person again in History Colorado. Tonight was not one of those uh, sessions just because the weather was not really good in the morning and tonight is going to be pretty cold and who knows how the roads are going to be. So why not just gathering like we are right here via Zoom, enjoying our nice hot drink, whatever you're drinking, in a cozy up in that nice fireplace that I see there in Mary Conroy's house. That's really nice. So um, this is uh, a good way to, to gather for, uh, for this last meeting. So we are um, going to get started. Uh, and we're going to have our program director, Naomi Heiser, that will introduce our speaker, but also giving us a teaser about what's coming up uh, on 2023 for our society. So Naomi, take it away. Right. Thanks, Angel. Everyone hear me okay? Yes. We can. Okay, good. So um, thanks for having a wonderful fall season with us. And um, we're going to take a break until January, on um, January 24th. In the spring, we're going to have Matthew Mingus from University of New Mexico in Gallup, and he's talking about mapping a defeated Germany in the aftermath of World War II. Um, then in March, we will most likely have Susan Schulten from DU, our local um, cartographic historian, and she will be speaking on her most recent book, which is about Emma Willard and her maps of history. Um, so tonight, we welcome Stephen Nadler to tell us about maps on stamps and other types of ephemera. Steve stole his automotive paint business 23 years ago. In semi-retirement, he is a facilitator for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at University College, University of Denver, where he presents on Afghanistan and world history through stamps. He is a lifelong philatelist, a stamp collector. Is that how you say it, Steve? Yes. Good, okay, and extensively involved in many philatelic organizations. Steve is the co-founder of the Colorado American Afghan Alliance, and he speaks Dari, is that how you say that? The Afghan yes. version of Farsi or Persian, and was a Peace Corps volunteer in Afghanistan. Over the course of a career, a long career, Steve was a CPA and certified management consultant to small and medium-sized businesses and organizations for 18 years. And thank you, Steve, for being so flexible about presenting tonight on Zoom due to the inclement weather. So take it away, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's time to sit back and relax. We're gonna go over uh, a variety of uh, products that show maps, including postcards, trade cards, a poster stamp, charity labels, uh, covers, which we call envelopes, which we call covers in Letterly, Maxim cards, and a telegram. The common denominator for all of this is maps. So this is just a brief, uh, a, a brief background about stamp collecting. I don't want to read it if I don't have to. Can everybody see it? If you can, if you can't see it, uh, uh, let me know or let on hell know, and looks, I'll read it out loud. It looks good, Steve. So we can read it. So if you can give us one minute to read it. <laughs> yeah. Whoops.
Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are a few points that I would like to make about maps on stamps. The latest count is that there are approximately 43,000 43, plus maps on stamps worldwide. It's a topical collection. A topical collection differs in stamp collecting from country collections. So a typical topical collection might be birds on stamps, paintings on stamps, for the men in the audience, nudes on stamps, for the women in the audience, costumes on stamps, and so forth. You pick a topic and it's probably available in the world of stamps. The umbrella organization in the United States is called the American Topical Association. And within it is a subgroup called the Carto Philatelic Society. I would encourage people who are interested to go to their browser and enter maps on stamps, not right now, but later. And you'll be able to find several sites to visit. There are a variety of ways to collect maps on stamps by geography, by history, propaganda, by wars, any, any kind of a topic you can think of within maps is probably available on stamps throughout the world. What do maps on stamps tell us about the country issuing them? Well, they get into the history, the personalities, the geography, uh, uh, propaganda, and so forth. How you too can become a philatelist and postal historian collecting maps on stamps. You can find maps on stamps on the internet, through eBay, through auction houses. There's a website called Stamp Auction Network where they have every day a variety of auctions of stamps. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, before we started, we have the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library in Denver, where you can go to purchase stamps at starting at five cents a piece. And there is a book on maps on stamps, a, a stock book, where you can go in and buy them at five cents each. So in terms of expense, maps on stamps can range anywhere from a few pennies to several dollars, or even uh, uh, up to 50 or $100, depending upon how rare or scarce it might be. So here is the slide of Afghanistan showing the, uh, the country of Afghanistan uh, depicted on two different stamps. One was issued in 1964, the other in 1966. I purchased these at the post office in Kabul at the time they were issued. I'm asking, what are the calendar dates in Islam? You can see the, if I use my cursor, can you see where my cursor is? Yes. Okay, so that is one date, and the other date is over here. So this date is the Muslim date of 1343, from the date of the death of Muhammad. Over here is the date 1345. 
I'm asking why is the French language used on these stamps? Vivite l'Afghanistan. It's not in English. The reason is there were three Anglo-Afghan wars that took place in Afghanistan, 1839 to 41, 1870-71, and roughly around 1920 after World War I. So the British are not very well liked by the Afghans. And that's why they use the French language on their stamps. This is a Arbuckle trade card. If you purchased coffee in 1895 in a package from Arbuckles, included in the package would be a trade card, such as this one. It was to encourage purchases. It was a marketing device. So this particular trade card came out around 1900, and it shows Afghanistan and India. However, Pakistan is partitioned from India in 1947. This is the Indus River, and it flows through Pakistan today. Notice how some of the words are interesting. Russia in Asia. The spelling of Kabul and the location of China on this map. This is the backside of that trade card. They produced uh, a set of 50 nation maps listed here for collecting purposes. So to get a complete set, obviously you would be purchasing at least 50 packages of Arbuckle's coffee. I'm gonna move on. We can come back to this in the question period if you wanna read about some of this I want to uh, move on for time purposes. This stamp was issued in 1969 for the, the, the day of Pashtunistan. I don't know how many of you have heard about or know about Pashtunistan. Pashtunistan is a in it's historically it's been an independent movement within the Pashtun populations in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. You can see over here the map with the light green border. This is the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan as it exists today. It was established in 1893, and it's called the Durand Line. From this point on the Iranian border, actually this point here is three countries, Iranian, Iran to the north, Pakistan, Balochistan to the south, and Afghanistan to the, to the northeast. This line, this Durand line was established in 1893 as a demarcation point between the Russian empire to the north and the British empire and, the, uh, and its uh, jewel in the crown, India. There, both of these empires were competing against each other for influence in this region. And Afghanistan became uh, involved in that matter. Rudyard Kipling 
called this time period the Great Game. The distance from this point on the Iranian Pakistan Afghanistan border up to this point is the distance from Denver to Washington, D.C. So it's a very, very long border. And most of it is mountainous. Tora Bora, which people have heard of because of the uh, Taliban and Osama bin Laden, is in this area right here. The Khyber Pass, the infamous Khyber Pass, is between Jalalabad and Peshawar, right here. The countries bordering to the north include Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, the three stands. There's actually two more that don't border. That's uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So those are the five former Soviet Islamic uh, countries as part of the Soviet empire that broke away in the 90s. The term Istan refers to land of. So we have Turkmenistan, land of the Turks, land of the Uzbeks, land of the Tajiks. Argentina, this is called a first day cover, the first day of issue of this particular stamp is commemorated with a first day cover with this postmark, a commemorative postmark. And it shows what Argentina believes to be their interest in Antarctica, in the South Pole. So you can see here is Argentina and here is their claim to that part of Antarctica. Here are two stamps from Bermuda issued in, 18, in 1979. They are showing classic historic maps of Bermuda. One by Somers, the other by Speed. Brazil, to honor a stamp show in Brazil in 1972, they issued these two stamps, one by Vischer and the other by, uh, I can't, by Holman. Whoops. It's difficult, it's difficult to see, but this is North America, the Isthmus and South America. So it goes from north to south <laughs> horizontally. And this one, I believe this is the Isthmus and this may be North America and this is South America. I could be wrong on that. I'm not quite clear about that. This is a famous icon of, uh, icon of a stamp issued by Canada in 1898. In the mid 1890s, there were a number of people both in England and in Canada that wanted to reduce the rate of postage to promote worldwide communications amongst the British colonies. So what happened is that the Imperial British Post 
established a postage rate of one penny to be used on normal mail between any of the colonies and England. In Canada, that one penny is converted to two Canadian cents. So for two Canadian cents, you could send this letter, this envelope, anywhere in the British colonial empire, which is represented in red on the stamps. This particular stamp was produced on, th on four plates, four different plates. That created a, a number of varieties of this individual stamp. There were 20 million of these stamps produced. And from my research, there isn't a, a, one of these stamps that is identical to the other in that because of the plates and because of the printing process and the fact that these are multicolor stamps. This is one of the first, if not the first postage stamp that was produced in multicolor. This particular cover or envelope went from Toronto to London, England, showing a Toronto date stamp of January 16th. The, uh, uh, it's a partial cancel, so we don't have the full cancel, but this is called a machine cancel to speed up the processing of mail. Machines were invented to uh, speed up the mail starting in the early 1890s. And this is called a, a machine flag cancel. Here you can see, these are the four major plates of the same stamp with different color varieties. In the middle is called the muddy water changeling, which is not a production issue, but it's caused by oxidation over time. The inks during this period, some of the inks were unstable. So that's what would be causing some of the oxidation. The other reason for color varieties is that to produce a multicolor stamp like this at that time on a plate, you would have to produce the black, print the black, then print the red. And in this case, print the blue, three separate runs. Each time the plate would have to be cleaned. Each time it's cleaned, it could leave residue. So that's another cause of varieties. There is what is called fly specking or plating by some stamp collectors. These are stamp collectors that have nothing else to do. They get hundreds, if not thousands of the same stamp and they try to position each stamp in its location on the plate where it was printed. It's called plating or fly specking. And in some cases in fly specking, what happens is that these islands that are printed on these stamps, they have been moved from location to location depending upon the plate. So they move around and people are interested in collecting these varieties. Here is another Toronto machine cancel from 1899 on a piece with a flag cancel. 
here's a uh, part of a duplex hand cancel. This is the uh, the dial of St. Catherine, 1899. I came across this article in the MAP study group, the newsletter of the British North America Philatelic Society, 1988, showing the difference between a Mercator projection and the Lambert conic projection. And, whoops, there's a quote in the newsletter that says, I'll bet the Queen and Sir William Mullock would agree to Canada being shown smaller than the United States. For those who are interested, we can come back and you can read this detail at the end of the program. Here are stamps of the canal zone. These were stamps that started out being part of the stamps of Columbia over here on the left is a Colombian uh, stamp showing the department of Panama in 1887. Over here is a similar stamp with the same design with Colombia, but it's overprinted Panama up and down and canal zone in black. Those are overprints in 1904 using the Colombian stamps. And then finally, this is a map stamp, the same design issued in 1906 for Panama only. So the, uh, the design is the same all the way through. This is a sheet of 25 or a part of a sheet. And uh, some, some of us who are obsessive stamp collectors may like to get more than a single copy, but get blocks of four, or in this case, it's a sheet of 25 or a section of 25 of a sheet of 100. This is a first day cover of Panama issued by the United States, 1935. What I found interesting about this is that the image seems to be borrowed from this postcard from roughly 1915, a beautiful metaphor showing the two oceans kissing at the Isthmus of Panama. And it covers some of the, the postcard covers some of the statistics, the kiss of the oceans. Another postcard of the canal zone, this is posted on a ship called a packaboat. A packaboat is basically a freighter with some passengers carrying the mail. So the, the cancel shows Cristobal pack a boat and the date 19, I can't quite read it out, November 12th, 8.30 in the morning, 19, maybe 1920. The postcard shows the canal zone going from the Atlantic on the left to the Pacific on the right with lots of statistics and detailed information, including showing the topography that the canal had to go through. The Republic of Panama issued this particular airplane 
over map of P Panama uh, 1930. Uh, the AR overprint represents acknowledgement of receipt. All of these markings are of interest to postal historians. In addition, the 47.5 centavos, if you add this up, it's 47.5 centavos. It pays the registered airmail rate to Italy at the time. And the auxiliary hand stamp uh, uh, I'm looking oh, over here is Buzon colon RP. Can everybody see that? It refers to a cover deposit in a colonial mailbox in Cologne, Republic of Panama. So it was posted on January 16th, transited through Miami the 19th of January, transited through New York the 20th one day, and received 11 days later in Rome. So a postal historian researches all of this type of information, the rate, the routing, and the markings. That's what is formally considered postal history. I expand it to include social history. So for example, social history might re refer to the addressee, Wilbert, Presso Salenza in Rome. And maybe that person is the editor or uh, a president of the, the paper. Uh, that's part of the social history of, of this particular cover. Charles Lindbergh flew to uh, Latin America and or Central America and South America by uh, uh, on, on, a, on a visit. And this is commemorating one of his visits to uh, Panama. You can see the airplane in the vignette and this was uh, transited, this particular uh, hand stamp, May 2nd, 1928 says, transited Panama. Uh, so it went from uh, the Balboa Canal Zone, even though it's not listed or identified on the hand stamp canceling the stamps, this is the return address. So it suggests it was uh, deposited in Balboa, transited the Panama Canal, and went up to Whittier, California, along the Pacific coast. China. Here we have the Republic of China in 1945, a Statue of Liberty, the map of China, flags of Great Britain, China, and the United States, and Chiang Kai-shek, signing of a treaty between the three countries, 1945. 1949, the People's Republic of China, East China, May 1949, maps of Shanghai and Nanking by the uh, communist Chinese. Here is a map of Taiwan by the Republic of China in 1957. And it shows the start of the construction of the Cross Island Highway. You can just barely make out the highway here. But that's a stamp of Taiwan. And finally, uh, 1950, the liberation of the Southwest by the People's Republic of China, 1950. Showing different political periods of Chinese contemporary history. Cyprus 
here, this is a map of Cyprus, 1680 on a postcard. And here is the same image on a postage stamp. So it appears that are both images are from the same source. The United Arab Republic, most if not all of you re may remember that between 58 and 61, Abdul Gamal Nasser was promoting the idea of a United Arab nation, starting with the merger of Egypt and Syria. It didn't last, but these were stamps produced at the time to promote the idea of a United Arab Republic. So it shows the linkage between the map of Egypt and the map of Syria. This stamp showing the airplane is an airmail stamp. This stamp from Syria is showing the same idea of an airmail with this airplane on it. One of the interesting things that I think about on this is that in Egypt, 10 mils and 15 mils was the value of these two stamps. Whereas in Saudi Arabia, I'm sorry, within Syria, 12 and a half P and 17 and a half P were the equivalent. Another first day cover, first day of issue of this particular postage stamp showing Gaza as part of the Arab nation, April 5th, 1957. And here's a uh, cachet, what we would call a cachet of the Gaza. France. Those of you that have been to Paris have undoubtedly used the Paris Metro. And here is a multicolor complicated postcard of the Paris Metro sent 1985 to this person in Georgia. The Tour de France. This is called a Maxim card because it ties the image of the card to the images on the stamp. July 26, 1953, Paris, Tour de France. It's a souvenir, but it's very uh, attractive showing the route of the Tour de France at that time, commemorating 50 years of the race. Germany, Nazi propaganda, 1938. Over here, this postcard shows, is dated April 29th, 1938. One people, one state, one Fuhrer. And over here is the Munich Agreement, five months later, where the Sudetenland is annexed by the Germans, by the Nazis. And if you take the image of the Sudetenland here, you can place it into this section here on the earlier postcard. We thank our Fuhrer in German down here. Again, very uh, important propaganda. The Isle of Wight, just off the south coast of England. I picked up this postcard for about a dollar. 
just to give you an idea of what you can get for a small amount of money. Dated September 16th, 1913, it's half a penny. So within England, you can mail a postcard for a half a penny. And this is the Isle of Wight, local delivery for half a penny. And here's a, uh, an unused modern tourist postcard of the same island. How many of you have heard of the Republic of South Maluku? Uh, South Maluku, uh, officially the Republic, an un unrecognized succeeded repu succeeding Republic claimed the islands of Amban, Buru, Saram, which make up the Indonesian province of Maluku. And so this is one of those areas of the world where Woodrow Wilson's proclamation of uh, self-determination is taken seriously. And these people try to try to set up their own nation state, which didn't work. They're commemorating General Douglas MacArthur, uh, five years, of the fifth anniversary after uh, uh, the liberation, island liberation of the Pacific. These stamps were, these are bogus stamps. They were never used. Uh, they were allegedly produced by this stamp dealer in New York, who also had an office in uh, Munich. But here you see uh, a bogus, a set of bogus stamps promoting this uh, uh, independence movement. Monaco. Monaco has had several automobile rallies. Here's the 33rd and 34th and 35th automobile rally uh, associated with Monaco. And each shows a map of the route. These are very beautiful engraved multicolor postage stamps from 63, 64, and 66. Another Arbuckle's coffee trade card, this time showing Palestine. So Palestine, when this card was produced, was part of the Ottoman Empire. And it was a subdistrict of Syria. So Palestine at this time was a district. It was not a country. It was a uh, just a political area within this the Syrian part of the Ottoman Empire. And look at how they spell Beirut, B-A-Y-R-O-O-T. And it's showing a number of the major cities, of course, Jerusalem, Jericho, the Dead Sea. Right here is Lake Tiberias or the Knesset. The Knesset. So a trade card, part of those that would be collected of those 50 that were mentioned earlier. Over here, it says the area is 7,250 square square, uh, I'll tell what that word is. And the population is 824,000. Well, who did the census back in 1895 or 1900 that determined that there were 824,000 people living in this Turkish province? It's highly suspect in my view. The stamps of Palestine uh, leading to the state of Israel covered four different periods. This is the third period. The first period was during the Ottoman Empire, which ended at the end of World War I, when it 
the area became part of the British Palestine mandate where they issued stamps for that time period. And then when the British gave up the mandate and the United Nations voted to partition Palestine into two separate areas between the Jews and the Arabs, the interim period lasted from November 29th to May 15th. All of the British post offices were closed by the British. All their employees were uh, uh, laid off. So there was no longer a postal system in Palestine. And the, the uh, Zionists at the time, the Jewish Zionists, established a new postal system on an interim basis using Jewish National Fund charity labels overprinted in Hebrew with the word post. So this in Hebrew is the word post. And these stamps are showing the partition of Palestine into the two areas, which was accepted by the Jewish community but rejected by the Arabs and Muslims of Palestine, Egypt, Syria, and the other Arab and Muslim countries. Here is an example of propaganda, an omnibus issue, the same motif, you can see the the dagger through the heart of Israel, and it's promoting the massacre of Der Yassin, this Arab village west of Jerusalem during the Arab Israeli of 48. This is a very significant event, probably a milestone event in that war, because it led to the mass exodus of Palestinian Arabs from the new state of Israel. And a book has just recently come out by an, uh, an individual by the name of Eliezer Tauber, and it's called The Massacre That Never Was, who he has interviewed and documented uh, participants both on the Arab and Israeli side. And the determination is that it was not a massacre. But there were about a hundred, a little over a hundred of the villagers, including the fighters, the Arab fighters, and people who were in the same areas as the Arab fighters who were killed. Sweden. This is a booklet pane of six stamps showing a variety of different maps associated with Sweden. This is uh, uh, Carta Marina, 1572, showing the, I'm, I'm assuming it's showing the uh, uh, area of water surrounding uh, uh, Scandinavia between uh, Sweden and Finland, and also Denmark down below here. Here is a map of Sweden, Denmark, and Norway in 1662, a view of the cosmos in 1759, uh, a recent 1938 uh, topographic map of a part of uh, Sweden, uh, the old city of Stockholm, 1989, and uh, I don't know what this is, 1984. I don't know what kind of map that is. This is the booklet cover that the stamps came in. Stamps in the shape of the island of Tonga, uh, 
a souvenir. For those of you who are in the medical profession, these are uh, pieces of junk mail that were sent to physicians throughout the world by uh, a, a pharmaceutical company called Pulinet. Uh, also Abbott and Burroughs Welcome also produced these cards and sent them out. What they would do is they would print up 10,000 of a particular card like this. They would have mailings sent out from, in this case, Spain throughout the world promoting their product. So this particular script is pre-printed, pre-printed uh, marketing script. All of the scripts and this printing, it's all pre-printed as part of the production of these postcards for promoting uh, pharmaceutical products to these physicians. Two more of these pieces of junk mail. And these uh, cards are called Dear Doctor cards. And there are people that focus on these cards and collect them. Here is a card that went to uh, Dr. Tan in Aurora and a Dr. Stum I can't pronounce his last name in Inglewood. But what they would do is they would send out cards from each of these towns or cities along the way. So this is the survey card or summary card showing the routes, and then these doctors would be getting mailings from each of these places with the idea that they would save the cards or look for them coming from these different countries. And of course, by the pharmaceuticals. United States, here's a commercial advertising cover promoting a private railroad land development in Colorado mailed from Denver 19, May 19th, 1921 to Meeker. So envelopes, commercial envelopes like this or covers were used by many commercial establishments to, to promote their businesses. And this at the time would have been considered junk mail. Another commercial advertising cover promoting Longman and Martinez paints, showing the different states that they have 3,783 agencies in. Multicolor, uh, an item like this in this condition is probably a $150 item. $150 to $200 item. Chautauqua, Chautauqua Assembly Grounds, Chautauqua, New York, uh, the location of the headquarters of the Chautauqua movement. And we still have, I believe, two Chautauqua facilities, obviously one up in Boulder, and then I think there's one in California, a Christian movement for promoting health and welfare of the Christian communities throughout the United States through the Chautauqua movement. Another uh, uh, commercial envelope sent from Chicago, 1914, and the companies indicating where they're located and how to reach them on this map of downtown Chicago on the back of the envelope. Uh, 
promoting a Cram's unrivaled family atlas. The one cent stamp, unfortunately, it's upside down. However, it's part of the Colombian uh, commemorative series of 1893, commemorating the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. It's a piece of junk mail. It was one cent. And the post office required that it not be sealed. So the flap on the back of the envelope, the gum on it is undisturbed, and the flap is folded inside the envelope. And that's what allowed this particular company to send this junk mail at one cent when the standard rate for something like this at that time would have been two cents. Another postcard promoting automobile maps. What's interesting to me about this is here is a company promoting automobile maps in 1910. The automobile hadn't been around for very long. The postcard shows a postmark of the Boston Circuit Railway Post Office. Postmark Boston, Massachusetts, August 17, 1910. It was placed in a mailbox on a post office streetcar, used to process mail in Boston, like the one on the next slide. The post office has been always looking for methods to improve efficiency and effectiveness in the processing of the mail. And they were using streetcar post offices, essentially, for processing mail in these 13 cities in the United States. It occurred roughly between 1895 and 1925. We have here a postcard from San Francisco from a military branch, Camp Fremont, going to Fort Adams, Rhode Island, from one military base to another. This is called a flag cancel, a machine cancel, highly collectible. And the sender marked the spot of where the Camp Fremont is located in the San Francisco Bay Area, close to Palo Alto. A postcard promoting the Democratic Convention in 1908. A few stamps of the United States uh, picturing maps the Bird Antarctic Expedition, Ordinance of 1787, Annapolis, Oregon Territory, statehood of these four states, the Mississippi Territory, and then airmail stamps showing the map of the United States with two biplanes flying in each direction. And I pulled out from uh, Wikipedia the information about Vandergritten projection, and that's all written up here. We'll save that for later. If you're interested, we can come back to that. A poster stamp. This, these are also known as Cinderella's, created by many different countries, organizations, programs for promotional purposes. They can be found worldwide. They're not posted stamps. But sometimes people uh, try to use them as postage stamps. And once in a while, you'll find something like this on an envelope, postmarked, went through the mails, 
not caught by the postal system. It's a form of postal fraud. We're coming close to the end now, folks. A Baltimore and Ohio telegram uh, from Washington, D.C., September 1885. The sender says, yours received, in reply would say emphatically, certainly not, was entirely circumstantial in my not calling. Will avail myself of your kind invitation and call Monday evening. Please excuse this paper, have no other at hand, and am so busy, yours very truly. So Canfield sent his girlfriend, Miss Emma, this telegram. And on the back side of the telegram is this map of the Baltimore and Ohio Telegraph Company, which follows the routes of the B&O Railroad. A sampling of various stamps, maps on stamps from a variety of countries, Angola, Alderney, which is one of the Channel Islands, Austria, Bangladesh, West Indies, Barbuda, Colombia, Bolivia, Cape Verde, Burma, Costa Rica, Cuba, the Faroe Islands, Falkland Islands, Fiji, Gold Coast, Hungary, Iceland, Ireland, Kiribati, and Liberia. A second group from Mauritius, Mexico, Norway, Montserrat, Nicaragua, Niu, Pakistan, Paraguay, Peru, Poland, Russia, Turkey. Uh, this is probably the Ryukyu Islands, Tristan da Cunha, Umal Kiwain, and Venezuela. This particular stamp I would point out from Pakistan shows West Pakistan. You saw the earlier maps of Afghanistan. Afghanistan would be here. Here's the Durand Line, the Indus River, the border between Pakistan and India, and East Pakistan, which in 1971 became Bangladesh. Some definitions which we don't need to go over unless you're interested. Definition of philately, cartography, marcophile, deltiology, and completist. That's all, folks. Thank you. Woo. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Uh, just when I thought I had exhausted all my map collection themes, you just open up a whole new world of possibilities here. Um, but let's see, we have a few questions from the chat. Um, from Wes Brown, Steve, are these stamps and postal stationery shown in this presentation from your collection? Yes, that's easy to answer. And I want to say to Wes, you're partly responsible for this. <laughs> so I I don't want to get all the blame. <laughs> yeah, Wes can get a map in any piece of stationery that you can find. Um, Team Dammer uh, asked, where was the Gold Co Coast? The Gold Coast is on the uh, uh, south southern part of Africa near, uh, well, it's today it's Ghana. Gold Coast became uh, the independent country of Ghana in 19, I believe it was 1956. The president of Ghana at the time was Nkwami Kruma or something like that. Okay. Uh, so it would be next, it would be next to the Ivory Coast, uh, uh, on the southern part of the, the I don't know how to describe it, uh, uh, the southern part of Africa, not where South Africa is, but up above that. Question from Jim, uh, receipt cancellations were for what purpose? Establishing the date of legal notification? 
That's a good question. During uh, the up, up until maybe oh, 1950, 1940, uh, you'll see receiving cancels on the back of envelopes or on the front of envelopes indicating when it when it was received just documenting what the post office process was as to when it was received it, it's really no longer being done mm -hmm. another question from wes brown uh, is there a country that has a particular af affection for maps on their stamps i would say canada the map stamp of canada there are a couple other map stamps of Canada, uh, but I think that the map stamp of Canada is is really it's an important stamp worldwide because of it of the history of it, the timing of when it came out, the fact that it might be the first Christmas stamp ever issued, and because of all the varieties that one finds with that particular stamp. Okay. And you have all sorts of kudos. His great collection, excellent presentation. Uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. So that's uh, that says it all, Stephen. Anybody else that wants to, uh, last final question could be the chat. You can open up your mic and ask. How are we doing on time? It's 6.44. <laughs> So, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Mary, go ahead. Hi, um, I wanted to ask why you were in Kabul. Oh, uh, I was, I was, I served in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan between 65 and 67. Okay, thanks. That was fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you so Thank much you. for enlarging our knowledge of maps and stamps thank you very good anybody else okay if not thank you so much Stephen. again for uh just like mary said it's an enlightening presentation on on yes. a topic that i was totally unaware of so uh i uh i really appreciate it <laughs> and, uh, and, and and to Not everybody Yes. You had a question? Yes. Go ahead. The card that went from Canada, it said via New York, which was interesting. It went from Canada to England. And it said on it was written handwritten on the via New York. Yes. Know about it now. Frequently uh uh mailings were uh routed um uh, information about the routing would be put on the envelopes via New York or via steamer or a particular steamer at that time. So uh, there's a record, it's a record of the the route in which that piece of mail was, was taken. Very interesting, <laughs> good. Okay, for everybody, we'll we'll re, uh, this is going to be a recorded. It's going to be posted in our website so that you can enjoy it if you want to go back and check some of those stamps. Uh, if not, everybody have a great, happy holidays, and we'll see you next year with more of the great lectures from the Rocky Mountain Map Society. So, no, on home. Yes. Before you go, um, there's a request for Steve to share his email contact. Steve, do you want to just say what that is right now? Yes. I... Yes. Okay. It, it is S as in Sam, C as in Charlie, H as in Henry, L as in Larry, O as in Oscar, M as in Matthew, O as in Oscar, X as in X-ray at msn.com. And for those people that cannot pronounce it, it is Shlomo X. Let me actually put it on the chat. There it is for everybody. So Shlomo it's, at that it's, at MSN. It's Shlomo, it's Shlomo X in honor of Malcolm X. Okay, there you go. So mm -hmm. it's, it's on the chat for everybody. So you can copy there and uh, 
you may have some you, you may get some mail stamp mail tomorrow Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would like to encourage everybody to become stamp collectors, and I'm available to uh, assist in any way possible. Good. Hopefully, we don't miss any, lose any members here. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, everybody, have a good one, um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank Happy you. holidays. Happy holidays. Bye bye. <laughs>